hi there and uh, welcome back to the channel. I want to do a series of uh, videos on the Zoom R24, this little recording unit I have here. And as you can see, I'm using it right now. I've got this AKG going into uh, input one and I'm recording all the, uh, the sound, the dialogue that I'll uh, record today will be through the Zoom. And, you know, why use a Zoom R24 in 2020? I'm sure most people have their DAWs of their choice. They have uh, their computers, uh, you know, whatever they use for their recording system. Um, but the reason that I liked it is because I grew up uh, in an era where we always use tape to record. I'm going to be 52 in August. And um, when I uh, recorded demos for songs, I started off on little, you know, library re recorders, like the little single teacher units where you put the cassette in and you have one mono speaker and a little condenser mic on it. You hit record and play at the same time and you can record your, your demo songs. Then after that, I moved up to a uh, better cassette recorder. Ultimately, a friend of mine had a four track recorder and he would allow me to use it. Uh, we would record our songs that we wrote together and uh, we sort of learned how to record by playing around that playing around with that thing on the weekends. So uh, from there, I think the next thing that I did was uh, I got into using, you know, open reel decks like uh, Tascam 32, moved up to the Tascam 38, which actually is an eight track, uh, half inch reel to reel tape, open reel tape recorder. And then I got a better unit, a TSR-8 also by Tascam. But um, ultimately, I got really frustrated with home analog recording. And because I was sort of an analog snob and, and I had really enjoyed uh, making records on one inch and two inch tape, and I really liked the way the little bit of engineering that I'd done uh, on tape. I had, you know, really enjoyed the the way you can like really slam drums and analog. Like the, almost nothing ever really distorts an analog uh, when you're recording. Of course, it it can and it will, but you get a lot more leeway. You can really like push your drums really hard, like get a really fat saturated sound. Um, there's something about compression and tape that's really interesting too. It really takes that well and does interesting things with it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the best results you'll ever get from tape come from going to a really nice, you know, recording facility and working with, you know, some uh, engineer that's put in a lot of hours learning how to use the machine, keeps the machine calibrated and um, in good condition at all times for his clients and knows how to do all the work himself. And then the machines are easily serviceable. The, the problem with me for the, uh, the home deck, uh, you know, analog thing, uh, was that the machines were not very serviceable, you know, at home, you could remove the cards, but it, it was a real pain. And, uh, you know, the, the cards were a little dinky. They used like cheap parts on them and the, 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 uh, the entire like drive system was wonky at all times. So you'd be recording, and he'd have to hit stop and he'd hit rewind and suddenly he'd fast forward or go some other way. And honestly, at the end of the day, um, you can do so much better with a little recorder like this, you know, than you can with the real decks as far as like sound quality. Now you have to learn how to record in digital if you came from analog because you got to learn the differences. But uh, once you learn those differences and you understand how not to peak and how, you know, how distortion works in, in, in a digital recording environment, um, it actually makes very good recordings. You'd be hard pressed to be able to tell the difference between an analog version and a digital version, blah, blah, blah. It's more for the person using it, you know, and the fact that uh, tape has good archival. Um, it's, a, it's a good uh, medium for archiving uh, uh, as long as things don't catch on fire, you know. So anyway, uh, the reason that I used it was because of my old fashioned ways of being, I'm also was always used to using faders, you know? So like when you're using a tape deck, you're going to have a, a board of some kind of deck of some kind that you're going to be doing your fading and your turning of knobs and whatnot. And, uh, I just didn't get that feeling from computers. Uh, it just didn't give me the same kind of tactile response, you know, like hands-on sort of thing. And I like to mix with faders, you know, and of course you can use this zoom as a DAW, uh, control space. You know, you could be, it could run your, your computer, whatever you have up there. Uh, you can use this as, to, as a controller for it. So you could use this in, some kind of combination way uh, but since I'm old-fashioned like I said I just like to have a recording unit that I work on and then later I output 
to the computer and I use software like lately I've been using audacity it's free and easy and I use that to finish off mastering finish up uh, I do I use it to clean up tracks uh, so like I'll record a track here like say it's a snare drum so I'm gonna record a snare drum on input one right I'll do the entire take or well, it's an entire kit of drums but I'll take the input from just the snare track I'll put it in audacity noise reduce it clean it up um, high pass filter it uh you know eq if that's something i want to explore because something doesn't sound quite you know the way it usually does i may want to do some of that add a little reverb and uh you can with audacity you can use your own plugins so you can find plugins and improve it it's sort of just a, a skeletal frame that you can add things to so that's been kind of my process. And then I'll do that with each track and then I'll go back into this thing. So now that I still have, I have the cleaned up kind of digitized versions in here uh, and I can still manipulate them with the faders. I'm not, you know, back into the computer again. And then ultimately when I'm done with the song, I'll mix and master here and then sort of finish the mastering in the computer. But you could literally do everything in here and never leave this unit. Uh, and have this uh, do everything you want to do, including record, mixing, and ultimately mastering. And the other thing is if you don't have tons of experience recording things, um, this thing can be a little daunting, you know, because there's a lot of features and there's banks and there's effects banks and there's this and there's that. Um, but ultimately, it's pretty straightforward and simple to use. And so uh, you can use it uh, uh, to record and, and mix and master, and you don't have to be able to access a computer. So I think that's kind of a cool, uh, cool thing, especially for people like me who sort of enjoy working in this sort of half computer, half standalone unit uh, way. Um, so what I'm going to do is, as I stated, there's a lot of like different settings on this thing. There's all kinds of effects banks. Um, you can uh, get guitar simulators and bass simulators, and it has a drum machine and a, you know all that kind of stuff on it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify the instructional element of the Zoom itself by just showing you what I do. Uh, because there's lots of, I believe there's a few videos out there already where guys have painstakingly gone through this thing, like from the po from the point of turning it on till the last little thing you could possibly um, do with the machine. Uh, they go over that in, in great detail. And so, if you wanted to learn like how to use the machine, you know, every bit of it, you know, like the way you would do if you were to go through like an instructional manual or like take a course, um, that's already out there. And so what I was thinking of doing is something that's a little more specific. So I'll show you what I do in order to output the what to get the output that I get from the material that I'm recording. I'll show you what I do, like the steps that I take. And that might provide sort of a shortcut path for somebody who's never messed around with one of these before and uh, just wants to get right to the action. Like, what is it that you do to make it sound like this? How do you use compression? You know, how do you record multiple things at once? Whatever, you know, whatever the question may be be I'm hoping that me doing this demo of me recording my one-man band kind of thing where I'm gonna do uh, drums bass guitar electric guitar vocals and I'll show you how I make take each step and how I record each thing what I use what effects I use and how I mix and master I think that might in the end be uh, useful for someone I hope that's that's the whole point of the video and that's the goal so uh, what we're gonna start with is I'm gonna just do a quick overview of the zoom and like what it does and what it has and then I'm going to rec we're going to start recording drums and I'm going to do a, a drum track for a song. So we're going to kind of build a song. So I'll start with the drum track. I'll take you through the process. I've already got like half of it mic'd up. Once I move this chair and reset up for shooting that angle, I'm going to put the other mics in place and uh, just show you how I record drums on this thing. Uh, I use a pretty simple method. It's a four mic method that's sort of a combination of like... Uh, the Glenn Johns method that it was so popular uh, for a few years, and I'm sure people still use it. It's been popular, you know, ever since it was introduced back in the 60s. Um, and then another one that I, I found about 12 to 15 years ago called Recorder Man. Recorder Man is a two mic technique. And at the time I had two Cascade uh, Fathead ribbon mics that I had bought. I don't even know if they make that particular microphone anymore. 
But those are the two mics I use. And uh, the, this kind of simplified you know, drum thing, I think, works well when you're DIY and when you're in a space like this. Um, I, uh, of course, at some point in the future, I will probably be using multiple mics and I'll be miking all the toms and I'll be under snare and over snare and on this side of the bass drum and on that side of the bass drum and under the toms and over the toms and overhead mics and boundary mics and, you know, all that. And I, I tried doing some of that, but I ended up finding out that in the space that I have now with this zoom and the way that I play and what I'm trying to accomplish on drums, I, uh, I found myself, um, liking like a simpler mic setup, like a, a four mic setup that just seemed to be, uh, easier. And I didn't have phase issues. You know, I didn't have a lot of experience setting up mics. Uh, and so I'd had a lot of phase issues in the past. And this, this is pretty, uh, reliable as far as that, as long as you measure everything and just, you know, take a little care. Um, I don't find that, uh, I ever have many phase issues when I use a four mic setup. So much like in Recorder Man, where you have one one mic, uh, one overhead mic that's like you know, two drumsticks above the snare drum. You've got one mic there, and then you got two drumsticks going this way, sort of like over the shoulder, aimed at the bass drum. That's Recorder Man. That's all it is. It's two microphones. So you may not have that many microphones, you know, and uh, so that could be a good one for you. But I found after experimenting with it, I, I thought that was fine. And for certain songs, if you had a really light drum song, that might be the way to go. It's just kind of eliminate some microphones. You'd get less, you know, less bass and just it'd be less dynamic and loud. It'd be kind of like more, I don't know, a little airier, you know, like the you don't hear the snare as well or like it's not in your face as much. So that could be good for certain types of music and certain recordings. Uh, I found it lacking for rock, rock and roll music. You know, I wanted a little more like bass drum thump. I, don't, I really like a crack and snare. You know, I wanted that snare to be up front and loud and like sound like it's like, you know, smashing into pieces. I really like like a real cracking, like kind of woody sounding snare, even though I like uh, using metal snares uh, more than wood uh, for recording, uh, mainly because with the metal snare, I get more overall tone, like a little more bass, bass response. Uh, so anyway, uh, just like a bigger tone, you know, uh, but, uh, what I ended up adding in was I put a bass drum mic into play, which is like, uh, you know, about, I don't know, I put it out a little further than average, eight inches to a foot, you know, away from the front of the bass drum. And then I put a, uh, uh, I actually put this mic, this, uh, dif large uh, diaphragm condenser about, I don't know, three inches from the edge of the snare drum. So I've got the recorder man thing going. It's kind of like the Glenn Johns method. But then I add the bass drum mic and I add a snare drum mic. So it's a total of four inputs. And the zoom, you can do eight inputs at once. We're going to do four. Uh, so I think that's kind of an, uh, a nice attribute of the zoom also is that you get you can record up to eight inputs at once. And a lot of, um, you know, uh, units that you use, you can only put uh, uh, two to four into your computer. So um, I think that's kind of uh, handy to be able to do eight tracks at once. So you could do up to eight microphones on your drums to get your drum tracks. Uh, we're going to use four, as I said, and I'm going to go through all of that. Um, a couple other things about the zoom. Sorry, I uh, had a computer here with a, a list of things I wanted to say, and uh, it went dark on me. Okay, so why use a Zoom R24? Well, some of the reasons I've already stated, but I like the ease of overall use, you know, the portability of it. You can take it, uh, you could mix live sound with it. Uh, like I said, you could go and record your friend's bands at their house or at their space or whatever. You bring them to your garage or wherever you go. Um, it's 16-bit, which is probably the weak point of the unit, and that's probably why a lot of people just go, I'm not going to record on 16-bit, I'm 24-bit, you know, whatever. Uh, the thing that I will say, the research that I did on it, is uh, the 16-bit versus 24-bit is not so much an increase in resolution. So it's not like the, you're going to get like way better sound with 24-bit like just right off the bat, or that it'll be noticeable. I think that what it does, uh, and, and I don't want to get into a big description of it because there's so many people that know so much more about um, bit rate and depth and all that stuff uh, more than I do. It's not very interesting to me, but um, the main thing that I was able to take in is that you, 
you have a better uh, 16 bit is inferior to 24 bit and that you can just put so much more into 24 bit and somehow that does probably make things sound better I don't know exactly how somebody probably can comment and explain it all but um, uh, at the same time 16 bit is the technology we've been using up until you know pretty recently and uh, it's CD quality and it, it you know it really is good enough I really do think I, I don't think that my recordings would just be so much better if this unit was capable of 24 bit because there's other limitations that occur along the way as well you know there's like things that there's little compromises that are made as far as like sound quality goes in order to just you know get the job done so I'm gonna say that that 16 bit thing is not that big of a thing because the proof is in the sound and this thing does sound good if you if you use it correctly if you have good skills as far as microphone placement you know what you're doing at least to some level to some degree you will get good results and I don't think the 16-bit aspect of it is going to uh, bum you out that much um, the other thing is that uh, this thing is filled with effects banks so like you have you can uh, add reverb uh, you can have like these settings that they'll give you uh, in the microphone thing so like if you're not too advanced with uh, compression and if you have no outboard gear Another big advantage, you don't really need any kind of outboard gear. You just need some microphones and some XLR cables. And I would recommend um, having, I used uh, this microphone pre here. I got this years ago. It's an MS-1B by Rain. It's just a simple black box, the simple preamp. But it sounds really good. It's very neutral and clean and clear. I really like it a lot. And uh, it's, it's powerful enough for a microphone like this. I don't think the phantom power on here is suitable, you know, for so I think that it would be good for, uh, you know, condenser mics and stuff like that to uh, have your own um, mic pre. So that's maybe one downside to the unit. The pre's that are on there, the mic, they're OK. And I use them for some of the drums. You know, you'll see where I use them and where I don't use them. Um, they're fine. But I do think that it would be notable and useful to have um, the option to use an out uh, a microphone uh, preamp of your own that's it that's independent of the zoom itself one of the things i learned on the zoom forum when i was looking up information about the r24 is that there is a complaint about low output um, preamps on certain microphones i have uh, used ribbon mics on this successfully large frame condenser mics uh, and I've used um, dynamic mics and they've all worked well, but I did notice with the ribbon mics that you have to kind of crank them up a bit, which does add a little noise. So maybe that would be the downside to this unit is that the preamps, if they were a little better uh, as far as the signal to noise ratio, uh, that would make this even better. But once again, if you know what you're doing and you you keep that signal to noise ratio in a, in a, in a good, on a, at a good point, um, you can be very successful and get good sound out of this um, so like I said it's full featured there's all kinds of things it can do I don't even use the machines but full potential I kind of you know figured out a workflow to do what I'm trying to do and I sort of you know I, I can't say that I'm like an expert on the machine but like I said I'm gonna go through and show you what I've been doing and that might really help you because it'll be a direct path um, uh, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna record a one-man band performance, drums, guitars, bass, vocals, and I'm gonna show you how I mix and master with assistance at the end from Audacity. So first up, uh, we're gonna do drums, and like I said, I've already uh, mic'd, I've already got the mic set up, I just have to put, get, move this out of the way, put the bass drum mic here, and put a, um, a snare drum mic here. So I'm gonna take a break for a moment, I'll be right back, and uh, we'll have that all set up. <laughs> 